hello everyone as you are tuning in today today is wednesday march the 31st and it is a, a great time to gather with you to go over the 13th chapter of hosea and so we are getting close to the end of hosea and I have to say that this has been a, a great study. It's been great for me. What it's done for me is drawn me closer to uh, in my relationship with God, to seek Him, not to let up, not to be afraid of repentance, uh, to see His loving kindness and compassion, but also His love um, by which He disciplines me and you. And so I am so thankful that we can look at God's Word and understand that there is no God like our God. And I'm so thankful. This is a special week and that this week is, is the week leading up to Easter. And so we will be meeting together on this coming Sunday for our, uh, our Easter sunrise service. We'll be meeting on top of the hill uh, behind the church at 6.45. They'll be followed by a breakfast, and then we'll have our worship service and Sunday school uh, following that. And so we celebrate this week what we celebrate all the time, and that is the resurrection and the new life that we have in Christ. And so I, I hope that you will be able to join us this Sunday. And if you're not, if you live somewhere else and you're watching this, I've I pray that you will go find a, uh, a body of believers that you can, can fellowship with and celebrate with. So every now and then, I like to just share with you some things that I'm doing in my own personal life as I seek to grow in my relationship with Jesus, uh, because my desire more than anything is for you to grow in your relationship with Jesus. I want you to know Him and to to grow to love Him and be intimate with Him more and more. And so a couple of things that, that I'm doing right now, um, and these are things that you can do as well, but one of the things is Scripture memory. And I've gone in, in my life different times. I've had times where I'm, I'm very serious and steadfast about memorizing large blocks of Scripture, and then I kind of slack off and... Uh, but, but recently I have picked up again. And, and so I have been going through, and just for me personally, I've been going through memorizing starting uh, Colossians chapter 2. And so I, I hope that you will consider that. And that's something that we may do here in the future uh, with our congregation is congregational scripture memory. We've done that in the past. We'll, we'll probably start that up again soon. Um, but memorizing scripture, not just for head knowledge, but so that we can meditate. Our belief is that God's word is living. It is active and God is speaking. And every time we go into God's word, we go in and we encounter our relationship with God who is speaking. And so I want to get his word in me and I, I want to dwell upon what he is speaking. Another thing is, is reading other books and occasionally, um, you know, I usually have some books going on, but I just want to share with you one. Uh, the one I'm reading right now is by Michael Card. It is called The Nazarene, 40 Devotions on the Lyrical Life of Jesus. If you don't know who Michael Card is, he is a a musician, a songwriter, but also one who loves God's Word. And so a uh, very creative approach to understanding the life of Jesus as it goes through the four Gospels and included in here are lists of his songs that were written in response to the life of Jesus. And so this was a gift from my, my brother and friend, uh, Teddy. And so I'm so thankful uh, to be starting this, but I, I recommend this to you. But let's get now to Hosea chapter 13. And let's pray as we always do and ask the Lord to guide us into his truth. Father, we thank you for your word. 
thank you for giving us the ability to know you, to know your word, to know how to live. And God, we desire that more and more. And so I pray that as we look at Hosea chapter 13, that you will guide us into your truth today. Help us to see who you are. Uh, help us to understand you from your perspective, not just our own. And I pray that you will help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. And so, God, I pray for those that are watching, that are tuning in, that this will be a time that is just a, a stepping stone to a deeper relationship with you, to more study of your word. I pray, God, that you will uh, work in the lives of people. I pray that there'll be those who listen to this that, that, that maybe they don't know you personally, but they are you're drawing them and they are seeking after you that God you will confirm in their heart and in their mind that you indeed are Lord above all and that you've given us your son Jesus who is alive to save us from our sin. I pray God that that would come to pass. So help us now as we study your word. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. And so let's begin with the reading of God's word in Hosea 13. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. And now they sin more and more and make for themselves metal images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. Therefore, they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes away, goes early away or like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor or like smoke from a window. But I am the Lord, your God, from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me. And besides me, there is no Savior. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast and there I will devour them like a lion as a wild beast would rip them open. He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. Where now is your king to save you in all your cities? Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, Give me a king and princes? I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. The pangs of childbirth come for him, but he is as an unwise son, for at the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. Though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind, the wind of the Lord shall come, rising from the wilderness, and his fountain shall dry up. His spring shall be parched, and it shall strip his treasury of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and the pregnant women ripped open. Wow. A lot of imagery that we see in this, in this chapter 13, as is true among all of Hosea, as we remember and we're reminded that Hosea is a, a poetic book. It is a form of, of poetry that is used to convey the understanding that God is going to bring judgment on his people who have disobeyed and turned away from him. And, and so when we go through this, remember that if, if it's very, kind of difficult to understand that there is foundation, there is basis for this. And that's why I oftentimes reference, let's go back to Deuteronomy or let's go back to First Kings or Second Kings. Let's go back in Scripture and let's see that this, these are messages that have always been there. God has always told His people 
who he was, what he was going to do, what his expectation for them was to be, and then what would happen if they did not obey him or if they turned away from him. So there is no surprise in what Hosea is sharing with God's people, with the nation of Israel. There's no surprise. And there's no surprise for us that God is who he says he is in these, in these verses. It should not shock us, but it should drive us to him. It should drive us to surrender. So if I had to put a theme on chapter 13, it is there, there is no one like God. There is no one like God. And, and so we will look at this more. We'll break it down um, pretty much according to the, the, the stanzas that are in this passage and, and look at this. And so as we go through this, my prayer is that just as I prayed, that you would use this as a stepping stone to further study that you would take what, what we do here and go deeper in your study, deeper in your praying and asking God to reveal these truths. At the end, we are, uh, there are four passages of Scripture that I'm going to read that, that really remind us of God's love and His faithfulness and who we are and what we have in Christ, the resurrected Christ. And so please stay to the end. But let's begin now when we're, when we're looking at this message that there is no one like God. Israel at one time knew that. God's people knew that. There was an understanding. And we begin here in, in 13 verse 1 where we see it says, When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel. And remember that Ephraim is used interchangeably with the name Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom uh, of God's people. But also there are times when, when God uses the name Ephraim uh, to, to go back and look at the individual tribe and to look at what came out of it. But because really you can look at the individual tribes of Israel and but yet you, you can't separate them, but you can gain clarity in, into the people's character, nature, their faithfulness or their sinfulness. Um, and so with Ephraim, Ephraim, we're reminded that, that Joshua, the one who, who succeeded Moses, who led the conquest of, of God's people into the promised land, Joshua came, he was from the tribe of Ephraim. Remember that Samuel, Samuel who was the prophet, he was the last of the, the judges in the time of the judges. He was the one that, that God used to raise up Saul the king when the people wanted a king. Samuel was, was that one that was used by God. And so when Joshua and Samuel spoke coming out of Ephraim, there was a time when there was trembling and, and that there was this respect, this admiration for this tribe, Ephraim, in Israel. There was this time when, when God's word was spoken and there was trembling, there was fear of God in the land. But Ephraim incurred guilt through Baal and died. And we're reminded here that, that after the time of Solomon, so remember, we have Saul, who's the first king, then David, the man after God's own heart, David's son, Solomon. After Solomon, there was the divided kingdom and the northern tribes in, called Israel, the southern tribe of Judah. And so in the northern kingdom, Israel, the first king for that, that division of God's kingdom was Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam very quickly was one who had the two calves built or created in, to represent the Baal worship. And he set those up at different points of the nation of Israel for the people to worship instead of worshiping the one true God. And so we see that, in, and Jeroboam came from Ephraim. And so we see that, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. So we have this understanding that there was a good start. 
there was a recognition that God brought his people into the promised land. There was a, a reverence of God to hear his voice and to speak his truth. But then, then in the division of the kingdom, the first king, he set the example and the kings that followed him. It says, if you go back and look in, in first and second Kings, if you go back and read and you see that, that this king of Israel, that he did everything, he followed in the pattern of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He sinned the same sins, meaning he continued to worship Baal. He continued to raise up idols. He continued to sacrifice to other gods. And so, so we see this, this death of God's people because of their sin, because they turned away from God, who is the one true God. And so, as we go through now, we see the, in verses two and three, we see the, the futility of creating and worshiping other gods. The total futility. So get that. The futility of turning away from God. And so what happened he says, after they incurred the guilt of Baal uh, through Baal and died, it says in verse 2, and now they sin more and more. And, and here's a point I want you to remember, that sin always leads to more sin. And so if you think that you can sin against God and just let it ride or kind of manage your sin and think that that's all there will be, do not be deceived by the deceiver, by the enemy, Satan. But remember that sin always leads to more sin. Unconfessed sin leads to more sin. And, and so this is what God's people, this is what they were doing. They, and now they sin more and more. And, and what they did, they make for themselves metal images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifices kiss calves. And so this is terrible. So when, when once Baal worship began, then there was like no end. It continued and continued. And the skills that God had gave them to be used for his glory, the craftsmanship they took and, and God's people made for themselves idols, images out of metal. They use silver, which in, in that day, silver was probably worth more and more valuable than gold. And so silver, they took silver and made for themselves. Silver was very malleable. It could be beaten. It could be hammered out and, and used to, to make things of beauty. But here, the people used them to make the idols skillfully made of silver, the work of craftsmen. And it says, and, and not only did they make these, but, but it says, though he says it is said, it was like a saying among the people, those who offer human sacrifices kiss calves, meaning that they bow down and they worship. They offer up what is most precious to them, which is the children for human sacrifice to be burned on the altars and kissing the calves, kissing the idols as a sign of devotion, of love for these false gods. You know, the depths of sin. Sin leads to more sin. It always leads to more sin. And so I just want you to think about for yourselves right now, um, how are you using what God has given you? How are you using the skills? Is it for His glory? Is it a recognition of God? You are the only God. Or are there times when, when you use your skillfulness, when you use what God has given you, your talents, abilities, and you use that for your own purposes, for to, to exalt yourself? Do you use it to, to satisfy your own appetite? You go to great measures and you, and you sacrifice time and energy to do something that is only for yourself and not for the glory of God. But this is God's perspective on this, that everything that humans do is temporary. Everything besides himself is temporary. And he says, those who offer human sacrifices kiss calves in verse three, therefore they shall be like the morning mist. And he uses four things that are temporary. The morning mist the dew that goes early away, the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor 
or like smoke from a window. All of these things, if you think about it, you know, the morning mist. We're here um, north of Hot Springs, and I love it. It's beautiful in the morning time. Oftentimes over the hills, there is this mist, but it goes away, and it's no more. The dew that we know that uh, lays on the ground after those clear nights, early mornings, and the dew that's there, but when the sun comes up, the dew dries up, it goes away. It's temporary. The chaff, and this is something that the people would have known about on the threshing floor where the grain is laid and is threshed with the oxen, with the animals, the, the, the trample over it when the wind comes or when the grain is tossed up and the wind it carries away the chaff and it carries it away and it is no more. It is like it, is, it goes away or like the smoke from a window. So the smoke from the oven that is inside, the fire that is inside, it comes out of the window and it's gone. He says this is, describes those who use their abilities to make idols for themselves. Sin leads to more sin. The temporary nature of our humanity our world needs to hear this and know this today. We experience the futility of sin as we look at, at our media, as we look at the entertainment industry, as we look at athletes, as we look at, at our governments. If we would just look at history, we would see the temporary nature, but it's like once sin is there, it leads to more sin and we can't see out of it. But those of us who have relationship with Jesus Christ, we have good news that, yes, this body is temporary. This world is temporary, but there is an eternal Christ. There is an eternal God who loves us, and he has given us provision to know him if we would just walk in his ways. And so as we go through now, God shows that the works of Israel is temporary. It is meaningless. It is just the product of sin that leads to more sin. It is death. But he shows them that there is no one like him. Even though they would make gods for themselves, he's telling them there is no other God. In reality, there's no other God. And so we see in verses 4 through 8, uh, he, he uses reference that reminds us of his deliverance of his people from Egypt. And so it is something where you could go back and read Exodus again. You could go back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and Deuteronomy chapter 8. I hope that you will go and read these. Go back and look. We're not going to go back to those and read through those right now, but I want you to go back and read and understand that God has already told them what's going to happen. And now hundreds of years later, they're not listening, but God is saying, I was serious back then. I'm serious now. And so he says in verse four, but I am the Lord, your God from the land of Egypt. I'm the same one from the land of Egypt that delivered you out of Egypt. You know, no God, but me, he's telling them. So he's saying, you think that you know this God, Baal, you're making metal images, you're using your skills, you're offering human sacrifices, you're expressing your devotion, you're kissing these idols, but you really know no God but me, God is telling them. And he is justified in saying it. And he says, besides me, there is no Savior. So I want you to remember this. There is no other God. There is no Savior. So for Israel... For, for Ephraim, for Israel, for all of their sinfulness, they are not going to find another God. They are not going to find a Savior in all of their efforts. In fact, they're, they're not going to find a shepherd, as we'll see here in just a moment. They are not going to find all this because there is no other God like God. And so he says, It was I, in verse 5, who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. But when they had grazed, they became full, and they were filled, and their heart was lifted up. Therefore they forgot me. That is in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
verses 12 through 14. You can go back and read that and see that. But what he's saying is they were like sheep and I was leading them. So God is comparing himself here to a shepherd. And so he's saying he's saying that he is a savior, but they aren't going to understand. There is no savior where they are looking for a savior in false gods. There is no shepherd where they are looking for a shepherd among the false gods. But they are like sheep. They grazed, they became full. When they were filled, they were satisfied. Their heart was lifted up, they were happy, and they forgot God. They turned away from him. So God is saying, I am going to be to them like a lion. There's no one like God. The false gods that they're creating for themselves are not going to love them enough to judge them and to discipline them so that they would return because they are not gods. But God, who is the Lord their God, and they've known no God like Him, they've known no Savior, there's no shepherd like God, He is also the one who disciplines them. He says, I am going to be like them a lion. And he uses a lion, a leopard, a bear, three terrible things, three animals that would devastate a flock of sheep. And he says, I will tear open their breasts and there I'll devour them like a lion as a wild beast would rip them open. And so let's get this in our minds. We see this is terrible, but what he's saying is there is no other option. There is no other God. He says, here I am. You have turned away for you have forgotten me. I am the only God. I'm the only Savior. I'm the only shepherd. But for you, there is none. Because I am the only one and you have forgotten me. And so I'm going to judge you. I'm going to punish you. And then he says in verse 9, He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. So in verses 4 through 8, it is a reminder of God is the one who delivered them from Egypt. So remember that in verses 4 through 8. In verses 9, 10, and 11, it is a reminder that He is the one who is to be their king and their helper. But yet they wanted another king. And so He is the one. And so, so we see God in His wisdom, in His in in his nature he says he destroys you o israel talking about the lion the leopard the bear who he describes as himself for you are against me against your helper he's saying i would be your helper i would be the one that comes alongside you i would be that one and then he asked the question where now is your king to save you in all your cities where are all your rulers those of whom you said Give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. So the references here, you can go back and look at it at uh, First Samuel. So we'll go back to First Samuel, chapter eight, verse five, verse twenty-two. We see where the people said, "We want a king, just like every other king. We are just like every other nation. We want a king." That's what we want. And God is saying, oh, but no, I am going to be your king. You don't know what you want. I am your helper. I am your king. But they said, no, we want a king for ourselves. We want a king, a man to rule over us. And so God says, he says, I gave you a king in my anger. Who was that king that he gave in his anger? It was Saul. It was the man who looked like what they wanted. And and then he says, and, and then he says, and I took him away in my wrath. And that is in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, where, where Saul does not, he does not recognize God, does not obey God. God takes away his anointing off of Saul. And so what we can see is there is no God like God. There is no other helper. There's no king. They are not going to find a helper nor a king from themselves, from the gods that they have made for themselves, from what they worship. The only God is is the God of Israel, is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the one who has made a covenant that he would be their God if they would be his people. 
and he would lead them, he would guide them, he would protect them, he would drive out their enemies, he would provide for them. There would be total security and there would be relationship. But God's people, they forgot him. They wanted for themselves what all the other nations had. And they turned away from God. And so what we see here is God saying, there is no God like me. I am the only God. And then we see God revealing in in verses 12 and 13, that Ephraim, Israel, they are totally unwilling to be delivered from themselves, from their enemies. They're totally unwilling. And he uses a, a strange picture to illustrate this. He says, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. And so this reminds me of Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, where it says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. And so we see that, that sinfulness is, is bound up. It is bound up in Ephraim, in, in God's people. The, his sin is kept in store. And here he uses this weird illustration. The pangs of childbirth come for him, but he is an unwise son, for at the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. So oftentimes we talk about the pangs of childbirth, the P-A-N-G, pangs of childbirth, those, and, and, and ladies, you know this, I do not understand this except in having kidney stones, and they say that that's worse than pregnancy. I don't know. But it is that wave of pain, that wave of that it is, it is coming, but it's not yet there. And, and the pangs of childbirth is used oftentimes from the woman's perspective. That, oh, that, that the, the, the birth is almost there, and then there will be relief and joy, right? But in this case, it seems to be that the pangs of childbirth of this illustration is used from the unborn baby's perspective. And so he is saying Ephraim, that the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. There is a need here for there to be a release, a set free, a delivery. Okay? There is a need for Ephraim to be delivered from sin. And God is the only one who can do that. And he is willing to do that. He is ready to do that. But it says the pangs of childbirth come for him. So it's like he's the baby in the womb. The pangs of childbirth are coming for him. But he is an unwise son. <laughs> so he is in the womb, but he is described as unwise. Meaning he is unwilling. He does not listen to what God has spoken to him. And it says, for at the right time, he does not present himself at the opening of the womb as, as if the baby has a way. He's describing this, and it seems, and this is my understanding, you, you may have greater insight into this, but it seems that he's describing Ephraim as that baby, that the childbirth is coming, the pains of childbirth is there, it is time for, for, for him to be delivered, but he is unwise the womb, it is ready. There's an opening, but yet he does not present himself. It's like he is breach. It's like he has the opportunity to be delivered from sin, but he says no. He says no. He is unwilling. His heart is hard. He has turned away. He has forgotten God, and he says no. And so, but God is reminding this of that he is still the redeemer, even in Ephraim's unwillingness. God is still the redeemer. And so we see, and we ask that question, who, who is like you, O God? There's no other God like you. you. There's no savior. There's no shepherd like you. There is no helper. There is no king like you, God. You are everything you're so ready to bring deliverance, but your child is saying, no, I'm unwilling. I do not want this. 
And so, God, we ask that question, who is like you, God? You, there's no one like you, because God, you are the Redeemer. He says in verse 14, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. Oh, death, where are your plagues? Oh, Sheol, where is your sting? And so God is saying that he is the Redeemer. He has the power over Sheol, which is the, the Old Testament, the old Hebrew understanding that Sheol is, is descriptive of death. So after life, there is Sheol. In the ground, the grave, there is Sheol, is representative of death. And so God is saying, ah, I have the power. I can ransom you them from the power of death. I shall redeem them from death is what he's saying. And he's saying, oh, death, where are your plagues? In God's eyes as Redeemer, there is no plagues. Oh, Sheol, where is your sting? In God's eyes, who has the power over Sheol, there is no sting. But yet he says, compassion is hidden from my eyes. And so God is the only one who will has compassion to offer, but he says no. There is only discipline. There's only judgment right now because Ephraim is unwilling. Ephraim has forgotten. Ephraim it does not want to be delivered. He's bound up in his iniquity, in his sin. Oh, you know, sometimes it's easier to think of other people like this that are bound up in their sin who are unwilling to be delivered. It's easier to do that than it is to think about ourselves. But the call here from Hosea to God's people is for God's people to listen and to recognize their own sinfulness and to recognize that there is no other God like God, that apart from God, there is no savior, there's no shepherd, there's no helper, there's no king. Apart from God, there is no redeemer. Apart from God, there is no compassion. He is the source, but because of sinfulness, they are not able to experience his salvation, his help, his shepherding care. They are not able to experience his deliverance. They're not able to experience his redemption. They're not able to experience his compassion. If you're watching, listening, and you sense that as you, I urge you to surrender to God, to trust him that he is the one that there is no God like him. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But the, the, we continue on. And here at the close of Hosea 13, we could just say Assyria is coming. Judgment is coming. Here it comes because they are unwilling to turn back to him. And so verse 15, though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind, the wind of the Lord shall come rising from the wilderness and his fountain shall dry up. So the east wind, so where Israel is situated to the east of them across the Jordan, across the, 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 the Dead Sea and then the Jordan River, there is the wilderness. It is desert. These winds that come across that are bring nothing but drought, bring nothing but dryness that comes in and dries up everything. And so this east wind also, and, and we see, if you look at a map, you can see that to the, the east, that, that Assyria is really coming kind of from the northeast. But what he's saying, this is the Lord's wind. The east wind, it is really the Lord's wind. This is what it is. And it is rising up from the wilderness. And though he may flourish among his brothers, no, judgment is coming. And his springs shall be parched. It shall strip his treasury of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and their pregnant women ripped open. And so we have this picture in here of judgment coming. And so he uses this imagery of of he changes from Ephraim, which is the source of of uh, of God's uh, 
God's direction, God's deliverance through Joshua, through Samuel, but also Ephraim as the, the originator of Israel's sin through Jeroboam the king and all of them following after him. But then we, he directs his attention to Samaria, which is Samaria was the regional that became the home of the kings of Israel, the burial place where the kingdom was located, where the treasury was located, where all their, their pride, the, the kind of the regional symbolic of all of their pride, all of their storing up of all of their treasures, all of their power was represented there in Samaria. And so he's saying that all this is going to go away. Ephraim, judgment's coming because of your sin. Samaria, judgment's coming. And remember, Ephraim, Samaria, these are used interchangeably with his people Israel. Okay? So don't forget that. Don't be confused by that. And Samaria shall bear her guilt. I, you know, I don't fully understand the change in pronouns as he describes Ephraim from a masculine perspective and then Samaria from a feminine perspective. Otherwise, you know, unless it is referring to Samaria, it can be representative of Jezebel, the the pagan queen of, of Ahab, King Ahab, which Jezebel was so wicked. And it was because of Jezebel that Ahab built altars, temples to Baal, to the, uh, the Asherah, to the goddess there in Samaria. And, and because of this guilt of sinfulness, of idolatry, this rebellion against God, it says, they shall fall by the sword. And it uses this very vivid graphic imagery. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and their pregnant women ripped open. This was a practice of conquering peoples of the Assyrians. This, these are terrible things that were going to be happening because Israel would not turn back, would not obey. And so... I hope that we, when we read this, we are struck to the heart that God is so serious about our relationship with Him. And He is so serious about Him being the one true God, the only God, our, the only Savior, the only Shepherd. God is the only Helper. He is our only King. He is our only Redeemer. He is our only Deliverer that God is. But also, He alone is our Judge. And so the one that judges justly is also the one that delivers us. Therefore, we can go to him with our sinfulness and say, look, God, I have sinned. God is faithful as a just judge and is willing to forgive sin because as the judge, he is also the one who has paid the price through the giving of his son, Jesus. And because of Jesus, we have forgiveness of sin when we come to him in faith and he will deliver us and he will be our redeemer he will be our shepherd he will be our helper our king our savior he will be our god when we come to him in faith and so please gather that understand that let's live in that truth and so i just want to read some passages of scripture that describes and answers the question who is like god and that was a question that, that was raised by Moses in his song in Exodus chapter 15 after God delivered them uh, through the Red Sea. We see that, uh, that Moses in chapter 15 of Exodus in verse 2, he says, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. And we go on down to verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? In verse 13, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. This was Moses' description of God. Who is like you? I think that's what God was wanting to tell his people in chapter 13. 
that he's saying to them, there is no one like me. I am your God. I'm the only God that you know. And he's wanting them to remember. And then if we go on over to, to, to Micah, to Micah in, in the last chapter of Micah, in chapter 7, verse 18, Micah asked the question, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Micah the prophet speaking the words of the Lord. Who is a God like you? There is none. And then we go to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 10, where he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his father, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? God wants us to ask Him. We don't want to be like Ephraim, who is choosing not to be delivered. But let us do what Jesus says and ask Him. He desires for us to have relationship with Him in this way. But then let's close out with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul is talking about, and we'll start in verse 54, where the victory that we have in Christ because of his resurrection, he says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Does that sound familiar from Hosea? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And let us pray. Father, help us as we see you as the one true God who has given us Christ. You are our Lord, you're our King, our Savior, our Shepherd, our Redeemer, our Deliverer. And I pray that we would always be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in your work for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure